Okay, I covered our, our agenda for today. Let's get into these important updates. Um, this is a repeat slide from last month, but it is important. Um, all Tableau user groups are going to be moving to a new event management platform. This is happening now, like literally, this is our, our event that you're attending right now is the last event that's happening on the old platform, which was called Splash. I don't, it was kind of white labeled, so you guys might, that name might not be so super familiar. Um, in order to remain a member of the Twin Cities Tableau user group, to see, you know, to get all of the announcements and invitations to the events that we put on, you will need to uh, go to Bevy and rejoin the Twin Cities Tableau user group. And I, I will put a, um, a link, actually, let me just grab that link here. Put this link in the chat. So if you're so inclined at any point um, during this presentation to go and do that, I encourage you to, so we don't lose you as part of this, this crew. Um, next slide, but like seriously guys, you do, <laughs> seriously, please do this. Please go to bevy.com um, and, and create your account, rejoin the Twin Cities Tele User Group. We do have our, our April event is up and registration is open. Um, so don't miss that. And I can't find the chat. Where did my chat go? There it is. Okay, here comes the link. Any questions about the whole bevy migration? If you do, you can either unmute yourself or chat your questions in, in, the, in the chat. Okay, moving on. Um, <clears throat> oh, I think I missed one slide. Here we go. Upcoming events. Uh, so obviously this is not a holistic list of upcoming events. These are just the ones that are on my radar. Uh, generally, you know, speaking pretty local to the Twin Cities area. So on April 4th, we have She Talks Data with Jasmine Russell. April 17th is our next tug. Uh, and let's see. We do have a slot for one speaker presentation. Um, we have one filled already, and that is uh, Pete. Uh, <clears throat> again, terrible at people's last names. Is it Kataris or Kataris? Yeah, Kataris is it. Good Kataris. job. Yes. Um, he is going to present on all things Tableau containers, which is like, God, sometimes the bane of my actual existence. Um, and then May 9th is the um, the Tableau conference, which you will see me there. You will see the Fleurlidge guys there and a bunch of other really awesome people. Um, there is also a virtual attendance option. So if you can't make it in person, join the fun, or the at least not quite as much fun yeah, virtual option. And <clears throat> I had someone reach out to me on LinkedIn asking about local Tableau training opportunities, like local to the Twin Cities area and <clears throat> like in-person ones. I didn't know of any. Um, so I'm just going to kind of pose that question up to the group. If anyone is aware of any like more beginner focused in-person Tableau training offerings in the Twin Cities area, um, either put it in the chat or you can um, email me or or contact me directly and I'll get back to this person with any recommendations you guys provide. And then last slide here is an opportunity for you to do some talking because I hate doing all the talking myself. Um, if you, if anyone knows of any other events that weren't on my list, job opportunities uh, that they're hiring for, or maybe you're looking for a gig yourself, now is the time to just um, unmute yourself and holla.
<clears throat> Just let that awkward silence go a little longer. All right, well, don't say I didn't give you a chance. <clears throat> okay, so before we actually get into our fabulous content, we have a blank slide. Let's try that again. <clears throat> so for those of you um, who have been to a, a Twin Cities Help User Group meeting before, this is something that we always do um, because creating a community can't happen if, unless we actually like know each other. So <clears throat> we always um, take volunteers or sometimes I will just volunteer people from the, the participant list to share a little bit about themselves. You don't have to answer these questions specifically. This is just to help guide you in case you're not sure what to say about yourself if you struggle with that. Um, but basically just tell us what you want, what you want us to know about you, um, whether, you know, as it relates to Tableau or not. So we'll maybe take um, two people, depending on how long you chat for, one or two people. Um, do I have any volunteers? You can um, either unmute yourself or if you want to be like more classroom style about it, feel free to raise your hand. I think you can do that in Zoom meeting. Yes, Patricia. Hi, I'm Patricia. This is my first time on this, um, uh, on uh, coming to the, the Tableau group. And I, um, my company, I currently I'm not working. I um, am unemployed and looking for a job, but I, t I started taking courses at our community college and Tableau is one of the courses that I took. Um, I'm in now and learning. So this is going to be a good thing for me, I believe. Um, but I know a little bit um, just from teaching myself on Tableau and was looking to get some experience um, with it. So if anyone has some projects that I could work on, um, I will be happy to do so. Awesome. Well, thanks, um, Patricia. Thank you. Are you local to the Twin Cities area? I or am not. I'm in Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, were you, did you want to share anything else? I, I feel like maybe I cut you off there and I apologize. No, no, I am good. Um, that's all I have. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome. Thanks for giving us a try. And I will say that um, for someone new to like data analysis, data visualization in general, um, Tableau is probably the best place to start, like just getting involved in this community. I think the the um, the barrier to entry from a technical perspective is actually a, quite a bit lower than any of the other data visualization tools out there. Um, and then, like bar none, the Tableau community is the best. Like I I'm not even joking about that. Just in terms of people's willingness to like help other people and share knowledge and just be sure. really welcoming and open. Um, it's parallel does not exist. So I'm, I am glad you found Tableau and I, I think that you will, you'll find some good success. Thank you. So, welcome. Mm -hmm, thanks. All right, let's see. Um, Nicole. Yes. Hello. Whoa. Uh, um, I am, my name is Nicole Barada. I work for Red Hat. I am um, the data program manager in our content uh, department at the moment. It's a, a brand new role for the company and for me. I kind of made it for myself because I, um, I was playing with Tableau. I don't remember how I was introduced to it. Honestly, I can't remember what it was. I was playing with it and I loved it so much. I was like, I have to do this full time. So. Um, so I'm mostly uh, analyzing data to do with technical documentation, traffic, customer usage, that sort of thing. And um, 
I've been doing it full time for about a year now. My favorite thing is Tableau Prep. I love setting up all the data. Um, and let's see, this the struggle with, I have yet to really get into level of detail type things. Um, and uh, some of the issues I have are probably not Tableau problems. They're probably just the way we, we have our data stored, me trying to find what I need um, at work. And um, I am based in Austin, Texas, and I work remotely. So um, it's my first time at this meeting. Do you know, do you know Sarah Bartlett who works at Red Hat? I do. Yep. She has been awesome and is so helpful. Um, and we have, uh, because we've got her and we've got some other really awesome folks who've been using um, Tableau, we have some really great training materials that are like available to us internally. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Wasn't Emily Kuhn at Red yeah. Hat? Well? Yeah, she is. Yep. She's the other one I was thinking of. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you guys, well. you guys okay. have some rock stars over there for sure. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to, you know, absorb absolutely everything they can teach me. <laughs> and, and I'm pretty much going to any user group session I can within, you know, my waking hours. <laughs> mm -hmm. Love it. Well, welcome, Nicole. We're happy to have you here. Um, okay, let's see. We've got one more hand and I don't want anyone to feel left out or ignored. Um, so is it Amar? Amar? Yeah, it's Amar. Amar. Yeah. Say so hello. my name is Amar Deep. Uh, so I'm working for Accenture right now uh, as a data engineer, senior data engineer. Uh, actually, the project which I was working for ended on 15th of March. So I'm still with Accenture looking for project, but also I'm looking to move out of Accenture because I've been in data engineering position for a long time. I want to move to data analytics and data science. Um, before joining Accenture, I was, I was uh, studying MSBA program from University of Iowa. So that's where I was introduced to Tableau. Um, so, I mean, as a tool, it's a wonderful tool. I mean, you and the, especially the good thing is that you have the community is so strong that most of your questions are answered. So I have never come across a situation uh, where I couldn't find an answer for myself. But having said that, it's it's still I struggle with the uh, with the tool. It's just because of the kind of data we have, and also in education you don't come across a very uh, complex data set or a complex scenario. Um, yeah. So I cannot say about like what features or functions do I struggle with because generally I'll just Google it and maybe in an hour or so I'll get the answer. Yeah, so currently I'm just like looking for a, like to change to a different role where I can use my education in data science and data analytics. So that's why I'm here to learn Tableau. Awesome. Well, Amar, if you want to, you can um, chat your LinkedIn profile. Um, yeah. In, in the chat, and if anyone who is interested in um, in your skills, mm -hmm. can contact you there. So sure. Thanks for being hello. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, if we have time at the end, we'll do maybe a couple more get to know members. Like normally, it is just like we have no volunteers, and I have to just be like somebody. Like, I'm just going to pick on you. Um, so I'm glad to see that we have such enthusiasm to share about, um, about it. But we do have a schedule to keep. So let's move on um, with our agenda. And we'll come back to it if we have time. So without further ado, ado please welcome the Fleur Lodge twins, Kevin and Ken. Take it away, guys. Thank you. She called us Fleur Lodge. Did you hear that, Ken? Did I say it wrong? <laughs> she nailed it the first time. Yeah. yeah the first time. Can't want them all, I guess. <laughs> Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. All right. Well, first off, thank you. Uh, I, I love, we've done a, so many of these tugs, and um, I don't know, remember any of them being like this personable. You know, it just feels like relaxed. I feel like we could be having a drink or something. It's just, 
really, really nice to make it really comfortable. They all seem so very formal. So appreciate that. Um, yeah, so we're going to be doing our Tableau presentation from uh, from 2022, our uh, Tableau conference presentation. Um, just a way of some introductions. My name is Kevin. I'm on the left here. This is Ken on the right. Together, we uh, run the website FlurlegeTwins.com. And I got to move your little Zoom thing out of the way. And we are both what we call Tableau visionaries. I think there are less than 70 in the world. Um, this used to be called uh, Tableau Zen Masters. I, I don't know if I mentioned, we are, in fact, identical twins. I like to keep my hair a little bit longer than Ken, where he just basically mix it. But, um, and I'm a four-time Tableau Visionary. Ken is a Hall of Fame Tableau Visionary. There are only 16 in the world. So pretty, uh, pretty astounding. So congrats on that, Ken. He just got that this year. We're really, really excited um, because we have just joined as a team together, Moxie Analytics. Uh, if you're not aware, Moxie Analytics is run by Serena Roberts and Laura Madsen, two brilliant, amazing people. We've been nothing but impressed with them so far. We'll start with Laura. Laura's the, the COO. Uh, she really focuses on you know, data strategy and governance. In fact, she wrote the book on data governance, uh, author of Disrupting Data Governance. And she's also a board member of the Data Leadership Collaborative. And then Serena, she's the COO. Uh, she really focuses on data visualization, hence Tableau User Group. She's a five-time Tableau ambassador. And she, of course, runs uh, or is the co-lead of the Twin Cities Tableau User Group. More importantly about Serena is that her LinkedIn title is probably the greatest ever of any LinkedIn title in the world. I, I'm expecting that everybody's like cracking up laughing. Everybody's on mute. So I, I'm just going to assume that everybody's laughing at this, this wonderful title. All right. So how did all this come to be? How did uh, Ken and I come to join the incredible team at Moxie Analytics? Well, it really starts about a year ago. And the story of three people, myself, Ken, and Serena. And this was all in TC22 in Las Vegas in May last year. So we were happened to be at a Tableau event. Uh, we were drinking a few beers and having some fun. Yay beer, yay fun. And we it was getting time to leave and there was a long wait for, for the Uber. So we, we could see the Mandalay Bay. So we just decided, hey, we'll walk. Um, well, the problem with what looks like three blocks in Vegas is like three miles. So we spent about two hours walking and we spent you know, part of that time talking. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, of course, in super slow motion, Serena takes a step and starts to slip and continues to slip, of course. And she ends up on her backside. So, what could have what could she have slipped on? Like I feel like the answer is so obvious. Everybody knows what she slipped on, and it of course was nothing more than a ham sandwich. <laughs> and this may sound like embellishment, but all of this up until this point is a hundred percent true. She fell on a ham sandwich, and she she wiped out good as well. So as Serena is lying amongst the rubble of thinly sliced ham, extra mayo and light lettuce. Serena oh has a, she oh has a vision. And that vision is Moxie Analytics plus Flurlidge Twins equals world domination, or maybe just a pretty freaking sweet idea. So that's how Ken and I got to join the amazing team at Moxie Analytics where their primary goal is to enable people to solve problems with data. And of course, their secondary goal is world domination. All right, that's my stand-up routine. Everybody was cracking up, right? Things we do, um, lots of things. Data-related, we probably do it. Data literacy, visualization, strategy, governance. Uh, Ken and I are focusing more on the data visualization, uh, but we're offering our services in kind of a different way. You know, we will do, project work, but we'll also do a Tableau Lifeline, which would allow you to, hey, call us up and get an hour of our help if, if you're you know struggling with something. Or Fractional Data Hero, where 
you know, we're just at your, you know, working with you for a couple hours a week or something like that. So uh, if you're interested, hello at moxieanalytics.com. All right. That's not why you're here. You're, you're here to uh, learn how to do cool stuff with Tableau. We're going to be talking about some tips, some tricks, some techniques. We'll kind of be talking about random stuff uh, that all kind of ties back together. Uh, and we hope that it'll help you in your business. But if you like to do this on the side, it'll help as well in your public in your public uh, work. Um, we're going to move fast. I assume this is being recorded as well. But you can get to all this information at flirtwithtwins.com slash cool stuff, or you can scan the little QR code. Uh, we have that's that page has lots of links uh, to different blog posts and uh, different content that'll help. And we should say a big shout out to Awesome Community. Then it's been mentioned several times today, uh, but we have an incredible community. Lots of these tips came from us, but lots of these tips came from other people or were inspired by other people's work. So I just want to say thanks to these specific people. And honestly, a lot more because all of our work has been inspired by hundreds and thousands of actual uh, other people in the community. Uh, we also got to say thanks to the, the artists of this ham sandwich on Free Pick. Uh, very important that we say thank you. Not pay for it, but I did want to. Uh... All right, I think that's it. I'm going to pass it over to Ken, and he can get you start get us started. All right, thanks, Kev. Yeah, I'm just going to pretend that everyone is still laughing from that little cartoon thing there. All right, my screen okay? All right. Sure is, so, yep. I'm, I'm going to start us off with some cool stuff we can do with histograms. And specifically, we want to build this histogram here. So this histogram, we're using Superstore data here. And this histogram is binned by total sales per customer. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means here in a moment. But basically, you know, we want to, we want to look at each customer, sum their total sales for all of the Superstore data, and then count the number of customers to create this histogram. Um, and then we will add a reference line on the median, and then we'll use some color to just sort of show whether it's above the median or below or right on the median. Um, so, so that's what we're gonna try to build here. And hopefully along the way, learn some nice little tips and tri tricks and techniques and things like that, that we can use both for histograms and as well as our other work. So, if you're thinking about how to build a histogram, um, you, you probably first start thinking about bins, right? So we want to do sales. So let's create a bins field on our sales. We right click on sales, do create, choose bins. I've already done this. So let's just look at the bins I've created. Uh, you can see we've, we're bidding on, on sales and I'm using this parameter that I've already created bin size. You can see it over here and it's set to 500 right now. I like to use these parameters because it often allows, allows your users to sort of tinker with the number and look at different bin sizes. Uh, sometimes that's nice to have and, uh, and, and allows them to, to go a little deeper with their analysis. So we'll take this, we'll drag it up to columns. I'm gonna take count, or I'm gonna take customer ID and do a count distinct so that we get the count of those customers. And with that, we have a histogram. But it's pretty clear if you look at sort of the spread of the distribution of these, these are not the same histogram. So what's, what's going on here? Well, as I said before, we wanna do the total sales for each customer. And what this is doing is it actually been on each row, right? So it's looking at the sales amount on each row and created the bins that way. We need to first aggregate our sales by customer and then uh, create our bins. So if you think about how to do this sort of logically, well, we might create a calculated field sum of sales and then try to bin that, right? So let's right click that, go to create, and there's no bin option. And uh, the reason for this is that you can't create bins on an aggregate. This is an aggregate field. We can't create bins on that. So we're kind of stuck, right? Uh, this is where I like to introduce one of my favorite little tricks. You can use this all over the place, but you can use a, a level of detail calculation uh, allows, yeah, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, we can use a level of detail calculation to sort of create this, make this aggregate act like a non-aggregate. So when you use a level of detail, the result is always a non-aggregate. We are aggregating, we're aggregating by customer ID and the sum of sales. But the value that is returned from here is a non-aggregate. And because it's a non-aggregate, we can go to create and then create bins there. 
So once again, I've already done this. Again, I'm using my 500 uh, bin size. Let's drag this up over top of our existing bins. And now we see that sort of distribution that we were, we were looking for here. So one step out of the way. The next thing I want to do is add that reference line on the median value. So I've created a calculated field here to get my median uh, of the, the sum of sales. I'll drag this over to detail. And how do you create a reference line? You right click on the axis. And there's a couple of different ways, but my, my approach is generally to kick, right click on the axis and choose that add reference line. And you'll notice that there is no add reference line option. Uh, this is something I learned the hard way. When you're using the sort of built-in bin capability of Tableau, you can't create a reference line on it. So that's a little frustrating, um, but there's an option for this. And this is something I learned from, from Jonathan Drummy. Uh, actually, Joe Mako came up with this. You saw him on our list of uh, people that we were thinking, uh, but it's on Jonathan Drummy's website. It's basically just a calculated field where you plug in your measure, your bin size, and it will produce a numeric value that is uh, essentially bins, right? So we can take this, drag this over top of our existing bins. Uh, let's change this to a bar and let's not worry about the, the width of these quite yet, but we at least can kind of see, we still get that same distribution. And now let's try to add that reference line. So right click to add reference line. We'll choose the, uh, We'll choose the median option. Let's turn off the labeling and the tooltip. Let's make this a dotted line. And now we've got that reference line on the median. So I almost always, anytime I'm creating a histogram anymore, I just use that bring your own bins calculation. It's easier than, than running into these problems as you, as you go down the road. Um, and it's a pretty simple calculation. It's not, it's not very hard to do. So uh, let's address the width of these bars now. So I, I like my histograms, you know, as we've got here to be sort of closely packed together with just a little bit of an outline to separate them. Uh, so how do we do that here? Well, we can tinker with the size. So maybe boost that up as big as it gets, but still a lot of space in between it. And the other problem is if your screen size changes, you end up with this sort of weird overlap. So we really just wanna force it to always fit in nicely. So a trick for doing that is to set the size option to fixed, and then we'll drag our bin size onto the size card. And now these line up nicely. It doesn't matter how big your window is, they always fit that fixed width and look just like what we wanted to do. So again, now we're one step further. Now let's look at adding uh, the color to these. So remember that we were gonna add some color for items that are below the uh, median, the one that is the median and everything above the median. So we can do that pretty easily using a calculated field. You can see here, I've just done a simple calculated field comparing each of the bins to that median and giving me a list of these, these values. We'll drag that color onto the bar and now we have some coloring. This is using Tableau's uh, default color palette. Uh, I don't particularly like this color for this. So I'm gonna click on color and do edit colors. And I'm gonna choose a different palette. Uh, you'll notice though, as I'm scrolling down here that I have tons of palettes. I have not created all these manually. Uh, what I've done is actually just downloaded it from a color, pal color palette crowdsourcing project that I worked on with Rodrigo Coloni. Basically you can go in, submit your color palettes, and then just down, click a download button and get that preferences TPS file, throw it in your repository, and you have, now have access to hundreds of color palettes that you likely didn't have before. And some, there's some really, really nice ones in here. So for this, I really like this high, uh, exotic and high impact that Neil Richards submitted. Uh, for higher, we'll use this blue. Lower, we'll use this red, medium, this sort of grayish color. And now we have that, that history and that we, we built before. Just a couple finishing touches I like to do with this. I'm gonna clean up our axes and grid lines and things like that here and our tooltips as well. So now when you hover over here, we can see at the top, we have the number of customers at the bottom, we have the bin, so the zero bin, the 500 bin, 1000, et cetera. Um, I feel like this always confuses users. You know, what, is, what does zero mean, right? What does 500 mean? I actually like to show the full range of that bin. So in this case, it would be zero to 499 or 500 to 999, et cetera. I think that's much less confusing. And I think it's a nice little thing to add uh, to make it 
make it easier to understand for your users. So what we can do is create a calculated field like this. It's just doing, uh, just creating a string, you know, from the, the bottom end of the bin to the top end of that bin. We'll drag this onto our tooltip. And now you can see we have that nice range there. My only concern with this is I really like to put thousands uh, separators in my numbers. And especially when you get to these big numbers, it's kind of hard to, to see what they mean. Uh, so here's a little technique. There are a bunch of different ways to do this. In fact, I don't think this is a very good way to do this, but I like to show this cool little regex uh, technique. Um, this little regex thing here, this regex replace, um, and I admittedly do not understand what any of this is doing, but somehow I stumbled upon this at some point. Uh, basically, it's just taking a number and adding thousand separators to it and creating a string out of it. So we're able to create a string value that we then connect to another string value. When we use that here, you'll see that thousand separator, and that's exactly what I was looking for. So the last and final thing I often like to do with my histograms is just change the color within that tooltip. Uh, just a nice little thing to sort of tie the tooltip to the bar, certainly not necessary. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to do and it's a bit tricky and so I don't have time to get into it today, but I'll just plug our TC21 uh, presentation. Uh, what was it called, Kev? It was called uh, Make It Better, right? Um, and we show exactly how to do this in your tooltip in that presentation. So if you wanna learn how to do that, go check that out. It should be uh, publicly available. And in the end, we have this lovely histogram bin by Total Sales per customer. And hopefully you picked up a few uh, few little useful tidbits there uh, for next time you build, build a histogram as well. So switching gears, let's talk about some cool stuff with set control. So Filippos Limperopoulos was, uh, he's now moved on from Tableau. He's getting his uh, MBA at Harvard, uh, but he was a director of product management at Tableau Server. And he worked a lot on uh, the set control functionality. And sets, um, and, and he describes sets as named filters that can be used in calculations. And that's kind of confusing, but hopefully as I show you this next sort of section, you'll start to see what that means and understand how it works a little bit better. But sets are nothing new. They've, they've been around for at least as long as I've been using the product. And, uh, but one of the problems has always been that they were sort of static in nature. You as a developer had to create those sets and your end users couldn't really interact with them. They couldn't add things to the set or remove things to the set. So I think they often didn't really have a whole lot of value. <clears throat> that really changed when uh, Tableau introduced set actions. So set actions allow you to create these sort of UI components, you know, you can create a chart that sort of acts as a button and that allowed you to then add and remove things from a set. And, and we saw a ton of innovation when that, when that uh, feature came out, but it was still, you know, a little bit difficult because you had to actually create each of those UI components. Set control, I think really sort of brings this thing into the realm of being a, a feature that we can use every day because what a set control, the set control does is gives you a dialogue box that looks and acts very much like a filter dialogue, but it's really just adding and removing things from the set. And then your end users can interact with that and we can do all kinds of really cool things with our, uh, our user experience by doing that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the basics of set control, the most basic functionality, which is really using it for filtering. And then I'm going to show you a couple of more sort of more advanced use cases. And then hopefully you'll be able to, to see how you might be able to apply these uh, to your own work. And we do have a, a series of three blogs out there that have a bunch more use cases in there in here than that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm sharing here. And I definitely recommend checking those out and, and picking up some additional techniques there. So as I said, the most basic functionality of a set is using it for filtering. So here we have a chart showing monthly sales by category and uh, we have a filter on category. So obviously if I uncheck office supplies, that's gonna be dropped out from our chart. We're only gonna see furniture and technology. Well, we can do the same thing with a set. So to create a set, we right click on the field we wanna create it on, do create and then set. I've already created my set here. You can see the set and then I've chosen furniture and technology. And then we can right click it and drag it onto filters to use it as a filter. 
Now, the options you'll get are the sort of in and out. You know, I can choose to include the things that are in the set or the out or all of them. In this case, I want to include just those that are in the set. And you'll see that I now just see furniture and technology, only those things I checked when I created that set. Now we can right click this and do show set. And then what we see is something that looks like a filter, as I talked about before. It's not a filter. This is the set control. In this case, it acts very much like a filter because I've told it to only show me things that are in the set. So when I check off the of supplies and add it back to the set, it's showing me the things that are in the set. But as I remove things from the set, they're being removed from the sheet as well. But the power of this functionality really comes in when we start to do different things and not just these simple filters. But before I move on to one of those examples, I want to show you one other way we can filter using a set. So Filippo has talked about using filter uh, sets as filters that we can use in a calculated field. So let's show how we can do that. We I've created a calculated field right here. And when you use a set in a calculated field, it's just a Boolean. It's going to return true or false if, that ca if the category we're working with is in the set. Um, Technically, we wouldn't have to write out this whole if-then statement because we could. This is just going to return a true or false. I feel like it's a little bit easier to think about this if we if we build the whole if statement. So basically, if my category is in this in the set, we'll do keep. Otherwise, we'll do hide. We can drag that up as a filter. Choose just the keep option, and we'll just see those two items that are in the set. Um, but we also want to add the set control so that people can interact with it. Uh, we can do what we did before and right click and uh, look for that show set, but it's not an option because this is not a set, it's a calculated field. So to expose that value, what we can do is drag the set to detail, then right click it from here to show set. And now that set is visible for us to interact with. So that's the most basic functionality, filtering. Why would you ever do this? You probably wouldn't, right? Because filters do this for you. You don't really need this functionality. But this is just sort of the baseline uh, knowledge that you need of how sets work in the set control and how to get them on the screen. Um, and we're now going to apply that to a, a little bit more advanced use case. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is something I would call an in-out analysis, right? So here we have furniture and technology. We have a set on our, our category. And we're showing furniture and technology in red and the uh, office supplies, everything else in the blue. And this is being driven by a set here. You can see in the set is furniture and technology uh, and out of the set are office supplies. So the in is in red, the office supplies are in blue. So let's look at how we can build this. So again, we have a, a, a chart showing monthly sales. Uh, we, want to, we want to break this up by category. So what we're going to, or by, uh, by the in and out of the set. So what we're going to do is drag the set to color. And we now see we get in is red and out is blue. And we can right click this and show set. And now we can control what is in and out of that set. So it's really nice, a nice way to just sort of compare these two different populations of information. Um, one problem I have with this is it's kind of hard to follow what's being shown in each. I, I look at the color on the chart, I see it's red, I see that's the in, and then I have to look at the set control to see that that's furniture, furniture and technology. So I actually like to create a little title like this that actually shows that for me. So I can see very clearly furniture and technology are red, office supplies are blue. The problem with what I've done here is this is just a text box or a title, right? And, and this is static. So as I'm changing the makeup of those sets, it's not updating automatically. So it would be really nice if I could create a sort of dynamic title that's updating uh, as I change the values of the set. So we'll take a quick detour here and I'm gonna show you exactly how to do this. This is a tip that I learned from Jonathan Drummy. It's pretty involved. Uh, so I'm just gonna show you sort of the basics of it. Um, but it's using these sort of table calculation tricks to create these comma separated lists. So what I've done um, is use this in list uh, function here. It's just doing these weird things with previous values and, and a bunch of other stuff. There's actually this feeder calculation as well that's doing uh, a bunch of stuff and tacking these together. Uh, don't let this scare you away. All you really have to do is go out to Jonathan's um, uh, uh, public, Tableau Public Viz uh, noted here, 
copy his calculations and plug in your own values and you can make this work for yourself. And in the, so I've created one for the, the items that are in the set, one for the items that are out. And then you can see, I get this nice sort of comma separated list for each of those. There's only one and out. So there's obviously no comma separation. And then what we can do is drag each of those in list and out list over to text. We can edit that text and just format it a little bit. We'll, we'll make our in list red, our out list blue. So we have that nice visual key right within the title. And you can see we have this nice text that we can use on our chart. But this is just one big table. We obviously don't want to use all of this for this. So what we, what we really want to do is sort of narrow this down to one row and then just want this one cell here. And to do this, we'll use this handy little table calculation trick. So last is a, is a function that will basically just look at each of the rows in your partition and just tell you what, if, uh, how many rows it is from the last one, right? So this last row will be last equals zero. This will be one, this will be two. There's also an inverse of that, which is first, where this would be zero, one, two. Uh, so we're saying last equals zero. This is gonna return you either true or false if, uh, if we're on the last row. We'll drag this up to filters. We'll set that to true. And now we only get that last row. And then we can just hide the headers on each of these fields. And now we have this nice set of text. We can drop it on our, uh, on our dashboard. And now as we change values of the set, it'll automatically update to account for that. Uh, that was, that was a, that's kind of a complicated trick, but it's something I use all the time doing those comma separated things to create lists like this or lists within a table of comma separated values. So it's really, really powerful. And uh, there are other things like the last thing that I showed there is, is something I do all the time, especially when you're getting into weird and complicated table calculations that need to sort of build upon each other. All right. So last uh, use case I want to show is hex maps. So I love hex maps for showing various types of information. It really sort of reduces the impact of, of large geographic states and, and really shows you what's going on uh, much more clearly. So here we have a hex map showing profit by state. Uh, we have a nice color palette. I think it looks really good here, but it would be, it'd be kind of useful to be able to filter on year, right? And so I've created a filter on year and you can see my years over here. So watch what happens if I deselect 2019, 2020, and 2021, just show 2018, you get these sort of big gaps within the, uh, within the, the hex map. And, and I don't like that, right? There's also DC sort of floats out here and you can't even tell that it's missing because you just kind of forget about it. Um, and I believe uh, Vermont is up here as well and you forget about that. So what I would like to be able to do is really just show them as having zero sales, right? Keep showing the hex, but there are, sorry, zero profits. Um, there were no records, but, let, but so technically that's zero profits, right? So we can use a set to do this. So I'm going to remove this filter. Uh, I've created a calculated field called year. And I've created a set on that year here. And I've just chosen 2018. Now I'm going to drag this over to filters, choose in and out. And I'm going to choose both of these. And the reason I'm doing this is I don't actually want to filter anything. The only reason I'm bringing this onto my view is so that I can get the set control because I'm going to then use the set within a calculated field, right? So I can add and remove things all I want. It's not going to change what's what's the you know the the states that are actually shown on this view. But the next thing we're going to do is use that set in the calculated field. So we'll use profit. We have this profit for selected. Basically says if my state is if my year is in the set, then give me the profit. Otherwise, give me zero, right? We'll drag this over top of and use this instead of the sum of profit. So, so let me pause there for a moment. How many times have you uh, done this exact thing where you've dropped a new uh, measure on top of an existing measure and all your formatting blows up? Your colors change, uh, your text changes, all kinds of things uh, go wrong when you do that. Um, here's a quick tip for fixing that. Instead of dropping a new pill on top of it, just double click in here and edit it in line. Do profit for selected, hit enter, and that will change the measure while maintaining all of that formatting that you've already applied.
So, uh, so now you can see we are, we, the set does just have 2018. If I hover over things that were missing before, DC, Vermont, you just see zero as the profit. And I think that's a much bigger improvement because you can at least see those on there. You don't lose track of the fact that they, that they exist, right? Um, but I do still have a problem with it because to me, I think, you know, having some sales and just very low profits is a little different than there were no sales records at all in the data. So I'd like to sort of visually show that difference. And we can do that pretty easily by taking our set. We'll drag that set over to shape. Let's edit the shape. See, we have this sort of solid hex for each of those. For the out items, I'm going to choose the sort of hashed shape. And now we have this vision, something is slightly different. We can tell Vermont, West Virginia, DC had no sales records at all, but they're still on here. We can still have some visibility to them in, along with the rest of the states. So that sort of uh, ability to do filtering within your data without actually filtering your view is one of the key use cases of set control. Um, so and that's pretty much all I have for you. Again, go to check out the, the three-part blog on set control and, and we get into a lot more detail, lots more uh, use cases there as well. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Kevin, thanks. All right, thanks, Ken. Tried to answer people's questions in the chat, but you may wanna check it out and, and put a lot of blog posts out there. All the content that we talk about today is in blog posts. There are some of those tips will be scattered, but uh, there just go to our website and search for a key word. You, you'll probably run into it if if I didn't already uh, link to it in the chat. All right, everybody, see Tableau? Ken, can you say yes yeah, if you yes, see we it? Can. All right, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start a little intense, and then we'll back off the gas, and we'll just do something that's a little bit more simple. Um, but I'm going to talk about how to do cool stuff with table. With uh, every time I say the word table, I want to say Tableau. Cool stuff with table counts. So <clears throat> Ken talked a little bit about fixed LODs. Uh, if you're not uh, familiar with fixed LODs, essentially what they do is allow you to aggregate a measure at a specified dimension. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, typically, what I do when we do this at the Tableau conference, I ask everybody who in the room. How many people were comfortable with fixed LEDs? And we typically get 60, 70% of the people raise their hand and say, yeah, I'm I feel really comfortable with fixed LEDs. And, and, and we'll talk only simple ones today. Um, then I ask some people, how many people are comfortable with table calculations? And we always get significantly less people that feel really comfortable with that. You can, in fact, build pretty much any calculation um, that if you, if you use the fixed LD, you can pretty much build it with a table count. And there are lots of reasons why you might want to use a table count over a fixed LD. I'm not going to get into this in great detail, but one of those main reasons is the order of operations. Fixed LDs are computed up here and table calculations are computed down here. So one of the things that we're always fighting with when we're creating fixed LDs is whether we need to take a filter and we need to add it to context to move it up. If you're not super familiar with fixed LDs, I don't want to get into the weeds, but there are plenty of reasons why, why you want to use a table count over a fixed LD. And I'll admit, I was like, I would be the fixed LOD guy probably for most of my career. And over the last year, I've really started using table calculations just so I don't have to think so hard about the order of operations because table calcs happen way at the bottom. So our use case today, for some reason, every time I click this tab, it's taken forever to load, not sure why. And load, all right, there we go. So we're looking at um, sales by month and we're looking at product name and we're just looking at three different products. These are the old Apple iPhone 5s. We've got a 5, uh, iPhone 5, we have a 5S and we have a 5C. And what we want to do is use a, uh, a fixed LD to calculate the last month that these individual products were sold. So we can see just by hovering uh, the iPhone 5, September 2020, uh, 5S, November 2020, and the 5C, October 2019. But we need a calculation to create that. So the calculation we might use is a fixed LD. So fixed on product name. So if we go back here, each one of these is a product name. And I am filtering the result set, by the way. And that's a context filter, by the way. Um, 
fix on product name, give me the max month of the order date. We have this date trunk stuff. Essentially what I'm saying is give me the max month that this thing was sold in, right? So fix on the product name, give me the max order date. If we were to use a table calculation, we would probably use a window max. So this is saying, give me the window max of the, of the order date, right? So very similar. In fact, if we compare them, we'll see very similar pieces. We'll see the date trunk month, the order date, essentially the month of the order date. And in both of them, we'll see a max in the fixed LD, it's just max in the table calculation, it's window max. Um, but if you pay attention, we've got this one glaring weakness. We've got this fixed on product name is really specified in the fixed LD, but it's not specified anywhere in the table calculation. There's nowhere that we say for every product name, give me the max order ID. So how do we compute? How do we set up a table calculation sort of like a fixed LOD? Well, we can do that using the edit table calculation window. So how this works, we can read a table, a table calculation just like a fixed LOD. So let's read the fixed LOD first. Fixed on product name, give me the max order date. And down here we have the window max of the order date. Whatever we're fixing on in the fixed LOD will be unchecked in the table calculation window. If we set it to specific dimensions, whatever we want to fix it on here will be unchecked here. So we could look at this and we could read this like a fixed LD. We could say fixed on whatever's unchecked. So fixed on product name, give me the max order date, right? So let's try that and we'll see how it works. So I've created these calculations. It's a little wider. So I've created just that first fixed LD. Fixed on product name, give me the max order date. I have that on detail. I'm just gonna drag that over to label. And we'll see what happens. September, 2020, November, 2020, October, 2019. They match the tooltip. We get, did exactly what we wanted to do. Now let's convert that over to a table calculation. How are we gonna do that? I wanna, you hear me say this like six times. Whatever we're fixing on in the fixed LD will be unchecked in the table calculation. So let's give it a try. I'm gonna edit this show you that we have that table calculation that I showed in the other window, just a window max of the order date. And you have to aggregate a um, within a table calculation. So I just add this attribute here. Uh, we call it an adder. Um, you could probably put a min or something like that. That would work just as well. So I have this on uh, my view. And before I put it on the label, I'm just going to edit this table calculation. Okay, and um, we've got this set to table across. I really don't know what that means. For me, it's not intuitive at all. So I'm gonna hit this, choo -choo, send this over to specific dimensions. And just like we said before, whatever we're fixing on, we're going to uncheck in the table calculation. So product name, we're fixing on product name, we're gonna uncheck it here. Looks like it's set up properly. Let's move this over to label. Sure enough, we got exactly what we wanted, September, November, and October. All right, so that worked out well. Let's try a different use case. What if we wanted to look at um, the last time any of these products were sold, right? Not just uh, you know the individual product, but we want to see the last time any of them were sold. In that case, we can look at the chart and say, well, of course, silly, that's that's November, right? All right, that's November. So I've created a different fixed LED. And in this fixed LD, I'm fixing on nothing. Right? What I'm essentially saying is for the entire data source, not per product, but for the entire data source, uh, give me the last order date, right? So let's see if that works. We'll put that on label. Sure enough, that's the last date there. And we see that same date of November replicated for all three of those. So for all three of those products, what is the last time any of those were sold? All right. So how are we going to convert that one to a table calculation? Well, like I said before, I think this is number five that I've said this, whatever you're fixing on, you'll uncheck in the table calculation window. In this case, we're, we were fixing on nothing. If I go edit this calculation, show you it again, we're basically fixed on nothing. So if we are fixing on nothing here, we will uncheck nothing. So if we uncheck nothing, that means everything is checked. So let's give that a try. You'll notice I wrote two different fixed LODs to get to these two different results. We don't have to do that with a table calc. I can use the same one. I can just change how it computes. So right now, if I edit this table calculation, 
you'll see just like before we had it fixed on product name, the product name's unchecked. So fixed on product name and it's given the last sale date for each one of these lines. So if it's fixed on nothing, we will uncheck nothing, which means we check everything and you'll see the result that November 2020 date, the last time any of these products in the entire data set uh, were sold. All right, we're gonna try one more thing and uh, see if we can kind of drive the point home. So what this is looking at is just for five weeks, sales by week, and we're looking at a category and a uh, order ID. And excuse me, uh, yeah, yeah, an order ID. So we got a category and an order ID, and I've colored them by the category, right? Then I've, I've got the, the on the y-axis, I got the sales, and I've double encoded it. The size of the bubble is also the sales. And then I've sort of spread out the dots with the jitter. None of that really matters. What I can tell you is all of this, this is all of our sales, excuse me, all of our sales in week 49. This is all of our sales in week 50. So the use case is, is pretty simple. We want to know out of everything in here, what was the max sale we had? For this particular order ID and category, what was the max sale we had? So I'm going to create this simple calculation. It's window max sum of sales. So this is essentially saying, what's my max sum of sales? This is sum of sales. What's my max one? So let's drag this on and see how it works. I'm going to just put it on the label. And we can see this value is 28.80 and the label says 28.80. So we're looking pretty good. And this value is 20. Wait a minute. We want to adjust the max. This is showing me 24.80 on the label. And this was showing me 18.90. But we just wanted the max. And essentially what this is doing is just giving me the sum of sales. It's not giving me the max of sum of sales. It's just giving me sum of sales. In fact, we picked some of these random ones down here. 527 is on the label and 527 is on the tooltip. So what's happening? Well, we can try and diagnose the problem. Let's edit this table calculation. And again, it's at, at table across. I don't know, table across for me, not intuitive whatsoever. So let's just click at the specific dimensions. Now, if we read this like a fixed LED before, we can essentially say whatever's unchecked, whatever's unchecked is what we're fixing on. So fixed on category and order ID, then give me the max on sales. Well, the level of detail in this is in fact, category and order ID. So essentially what it's doing is looking at an individual category and an individual order ID and saying, what's the max on the sales, which is there's only one sale. All right, that might've came out confusing, but essentially what we wanna do is say for everything fixed on nothing, give me the max on the sales. So fixed on nothing, we uncheck nothing, which means we check everything. And if we do that, we now see 2880 in the tooltip, 2880 on the label, 2880, 2880, 2880. Everything is labeled with the 2880, which is exactly what we wanted to calculate. We wanted to calculate the max sum of sales in this view. One last step. What if we wanted to see the max sum of sales for each individual category? Again, categories on color. So we have the orange, the pink, office supplies, technology, and furniture, orange, pink, and blue. For every one of these, we want all the oranges to reflect this 2880. We want all the pinks to reflect this 1890. We want all the blues to reflect this 1670, right? So all we have to do is think through it just like a fixed LED. We want to, in our fixed LED, we would say fixed on category, give me the max sum of sales. So in this case, what we're fixing on is category. We're going to uncheck category. Now we see 2880 for all the oranges. We see 1890 for all the pinks. We 16, see 1670 for all the blues. So really nice ways that you understand fixed LODs that you can understand how table calculations work. And I will tell you the truth within the last year, this has been completely game changing for me. Now, instead of like so many people do, they drop a table calculation on there and they just play with the, the settings until they get what the answer, they think the answer should be. Now I can just do it immediately without even thinking, thinking through the process. Yeah, and we had some comments. Sorry to interrupt, but we had some comments in the in the chat as well that said that that's basically what they do, right? So this fundamentally changes the way you think about it and makes it more logical. And and I think I think that's really really common. Like I did that, and I watched plenty of other people do that because I think there's you know five people in the world that really understand, really really understand table calculations. Um, but this 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 kind of process is what you do. 95% of the time. And it makes it really, really easy if you think through the logic just like you would a fixed LED. And if you're not really familiar with fixed LEDs, 
um, I put a link in the uh, chat about Ken, uh, showing Ken's fixed LED blog post. So, and it has links to several other blog posts as well. So that would be a handy tool. All right, we're, that was kind of intense. So let's back it down and maybe we'll just finish off with something fun. And this next section is gonna be called Cool Things That Are Invisible. If you've seen any of my presentations in the past, I don't know, two years, you've probably heard me talk about transparent shapes. Transparent shapes are game changing. And I'm not just saying this, I use them in every single visualization I ever build, whether it's at work or on Tableau Public, I use them in everything. But first, what the heck is a transparent shape? If I were to open PowerPoint and just draw a square, then I would go up to shape fill and, and say no fill, so the center's gone. And then I go up to shape outline, hit no outline, this shape disappears, right? Well, not really, it's there. It's just fully transparent. We can right click on this and do a save as picture. And then we can use that in Tableau in lots of different ways. One way is that we can load it into our shapes repository and we can use it as a shape. I love that technique. I'll show you that a couple of those in, in a minute. But then we can use it in a bunch of other different ways as well. So this whole section is all about stuff you can't even see. So let's go to our first use case. And for some reason, this one's taking a little while to load as well. This is something I, I build uh, in my uh, my old work. No, no longer. Um, with, now we're with Moxie. Well, maybe, who knows. Um, but it's a really a simple chart. It's really intended to help see how uh, uh, this sort of model helps us improve profit. So for example, if I were to look at 20% of my accounts on average, I would expect to see 20% of my profit. Well, we build models. My old company we built some models to help increase that. So this one is maybe 37%. Uh, and we end up building this chart a lot. It's just a, a dual axis line and a circle mark, right? But we always want to isolate a certain percentage. So in this case, I'm isolating 30%. So if we were to do that using uh, normal methods, we would maybe write a calculation that says, if the percentage of accounts equals 0.3, or maybe we use a parameter, then give me the sum of profit, um, the percentage of profit. And then I would take this and I would drag it. And this would be my secondary mark up here. You know. And by then I'm just like, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't, that's not fun. I don't want to even write a calculation. The fact is you don't have to, you don't even need to write a calculation. All you need to do is change this circle mark to a shape. And if you hear pots banging in the background, I'm at home and my wife is cooking at the moment. So apologize for that. Um, but I've got this percentage of accounts here. And I'm just going to drag this on the shape and then hit the shape card. And we have the circle shape for everything. I'm going to select everything except for 0.3. And I'm going to change everything else to a transparent shape and boom. Using a transparent shape, we built this chart without even writing another calculation. We can do this with a line chart if we want to just mark the last month, right? Let's just, we don't, we don't want all these circles. We just want to mark the last month. Maybe we'll tack on a label. I got this calculation that basically says is the month, the month of the order date equal to the fixed max month of the order date. Kind of what we looked at before, right? I'm going to change this to a shape and I'm going to put this on here. Now what we have is a true false. I'm going to change the falses to a transparent and we just marked that last month. My favorite use case for transparent shape is with bands, big numbers, right? We do this a lot in, in our work where we just want to call out a certain number at the top, top of our dashboard. And what inevitably happens when your users are um, you know, using your dashboard, they go here and they accidentally click and then everything turns blue and they go, oh my gosh, what I do? I broke it. Then they call you and they say, I think I broke your dashboard, what I do? Um, and the truth is, this is just natural thing that happens in Tableau. You can't control this color. You can't control this square or the size of it. It's really, um, it's just weird. And it always it confuses users. So we can fix that. This is what it looks like before. But if we change this to a transparent shape, and transparent shape, hit okay. And then I click on it. Now I have a much more intentional uh, reaction to me clicking on it, right? There's not this big blue square that's saying, oh my gosh, you broke something. Um, and I should note when we go to this transparent shape folder, I got a bunch of them in here, kind of different versions. You can't see them because they're transparent. You just have to kind of hover over them to, to see the outline. Now that's transparent shapes dozens and dozens of use cases on our on our website, but there's also some other things that we can do with, with transparency. So 
what would be nice in this case, this is that, that true false thing I just showed before, but instead of putting it on shape, I put it on color. So the, the most recent month is blue and everything else is red, it's false, right? So what'd be really cool is if I could change, you know, the, the, the opacity for the red marks, but not the blue marks, right? But if I go to the opacity and I, and I slide that down, what you'll see is it's applying to all the different marks on this axis. If I brought it down to nothing, they'd all disappear. I can't control the opacity for just the red marks and not the blue marks. And that's a real bummer because that would be something really cool that we could do this, through this, right? Pretty much you say something like that in a, in a presentation, you, I'm telling you, yes, it is in fact possible. Ken talked about his color palettes, right? Color palettes can be built in Tableau and you use hex codes, you use a six digit uh, code for, for a color. Um, anytime you go into the color card, you can see these, these uh, hex codes here. Well, you can build these out in your preferences preferences.tps file. If you don't know how to do that, just search for Tableau color palette, custom color palette, and you'll find lots of websites. When you do that, you can actually build out a transparent color. So you can see up here, we've got all these different hex codes to make up these custom color palettes. Well, if you add a zero, zero behind any of these hex codes, it turns into a transparent color. This is called transparent white, which is really silly to even call it white because it's transparent. So then you can bring this in as a custom color palette and use it in Tableau. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. We're just gonna edit the color. We're gonna pick this false. I'm gonna scroll all the way to the bottom. I've got this transparent color palette. It shows it's black, but it's actually transparent. If I click and apply this, you'll see that turn transparent. We hit okay. And now we've made these marks disappear. They're still there. They're just transparent color. So we can in fact use transparent colors in lots of cool different use cases. I use this quite often as well. Here's a fun little one. This is a map of the, of the places my family and I have been. Um, I haven't been to Wisconsin or to Minnesota. Wisconsin, geez, I blew it. You said Fleur Lodge wrong and I said Wisconsin, sorry. Um, I haven't been to Minnesota um, as a family. Um, and in fact, we haven't been to half the country. These are just the places my family, all four of us have spent at least one, one night. Um, the blue are the places we've spent one night and the reds are the ones we haven't. Now, I'll admit, I've been all over the country and probably been to about, I don't know, 46 of the 50 states, um, but my family hasn't. Um, but this is a neat little, fun little project, but I felt like I could do a lot more with it. So let's go to this one and I'll show you what I did is, loading, loading. Not sure why it's taking so long. All right, so what I did was first just drop the opacity a little bit, and then I'm gonna change these colors. I'm gonna change the yeses, or I'm gonna change the nose to white, and then I'm gonna change the yeses to this transparent color, okay? And you don't see any difference, but when I go back to the dashboard, what you'll see is I've cropped an image of my family out in the back. Uh, and then I've overlaid this map. So the places that we have been show through um, and perfect, uh, and they're transparent, but they're still interactive. I haven't filtered them out, they're still interactive. And the white semi-transparent uh, ones are the states we haven't spent at least one night in. So anyways, we're gonna have to get up to, uh, to Minnesota, uh, with, uh, gosh, I can't talk, Minnesota. All right, fun other little one that I've uh, done is using a parameter action i've got this sort of slider line the section in front of the line is blue and the section behind it is transparent i don't know if there's much of a use case for that it's just kind of fun all right uh let's talk about transparent images now we talked about shapes we talked about transparent color we're going to talk about images actual images that you can drag to your view so if i were typing with text in tableau if i type out an actual full URL, it will turn into a hyperlink. You can see that's just text. And when I clicked on it, it went to that particular hyperlink. What if I wanted to create a hyperlink in the actual text? Nobody wants to type out all this. What we really just want to do is embed that on, on this text, right? If I select this and hit edit, there's no option. There's no option to insert a hyperlink in Tableau Desktop. Um, so we can fake it. This is how we would fake it. We can drag an image out here. I'm gonna center it, but it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna pick one of these transparent images and then I'm gonna paste that URL there, right? So now when I hover over it, 
And let me put this, put it in full view. When I hover over it, you can't see that shape, but that shape's on top of it. And there is a URL uh, embedded in that shape. So when you click it, it goes to that website. So you can fake a, uh, a, tab, a, um, a uh, hyperlink using that little trick. Of course, we'd probably want to make this underline uh, in blue to make it look like a hyperlink, but you can kind of fake this. Well, I call the next thing an, an invisible trick as well because almost nobody knows it exists. I love using Tableau Desktop, but WebEdit actually has a handful of features that you can do in WebEdit that you can't do in Tableau Desktop. So if I edit this here, and I just edit this text, and I go to select this demo software, all I'm gonna do is hit Control V to paste that link, and boom, we made a hyperlink in. So way easier to, to create hyperlinks in Tableau Web Edit than it is in Tableau Desktop. Now, more transparent images. In this case, I'm, instead of a transparent image, I'm gonna use a transparent navigation button. So the cool kind of thing that a lot of people are doing is to create background images um, for their dashboards in another tool. So I actually drew this in PowerPoint, I had an artist drew, draw this, but I drew this in PowerPoint. You see, it's just one big image. Lots of people are doing this in Figma, but this is sort of a navigation menu. What I want, uh, and this is based on the, the movie Vegas Vacation, where they go to the, um, the silly casino where they play all these silly games. But I wanted people to be able to click on pick a number and it goes to the pick a number dashboard, right? And I wanted people to be able to pick on coin toss and it goes to the coin toss dashboard. But this is just an image, right? So what we can do is we can use a navigation button to do this. We can draw the image in another tool and then just overlay these navigation buttons. I'm gonna stretch it out. I'm gonna tell it to go to the pick a number dashboard. I'm gonna pick image. I'm gonna choose a transparent shape and then I'm gonna hit okay. Now, that doesn't show normally, but uh, when I click on this, it's going to navigate to that other dashboard, right? Really, really nice, really simple. Then I could do that four more times and have this nice navigation menu. The problem is when I publish it up to server or online or Tableau Public, using a transparent image, it looks like this when somebody hovers over it. That's really a kind of a weird response. And it's one of those things like the big numbers where people go, oh my gosh, what did I break something? And you didn't, it's just kind of the nature of, of how this works. So we can fix this with another transparent thing. And what we're gonna use here is a transparent character. It's called a blank character. It's not a space. Um, it's just literally a blank character. You can search for Unicode characters. If you're using Windows, the U2800 character works really, really well. I have it down here. You can't see it. It's a blank character, but it's an actual character. I'm just gonna copy that and we'll, we'll show you how this is used. So let's go back to that, that guy where it had that weird hover. Let's see if we can fix that. So instead of using a transparent image, I'm gonna change this to text. And then the title, I'm gonna paste that blank character. I'm gonna change the background to none. And the font doesn't matter because, well, it's transparent. It looks exactly the same as it did before. When I click on it, it navigates to the other dashboard just like before. But when I publish it up to Tableau Server, instead of getting this, I get this. A much cleaner experience than, for your user than this. So that's a blank character. Blank characters have some other cool use cases. So imagine you've built this nice little line chart. Again, still loading, not really sure why that's happening. We got this nice little line chart and I use this little, uh, what they call firefly marks. Sarah Batters, we made a bunch of these. They're just kind of nice, give a little design. So I've got this uh, line chart and a dual axis shape with this firefly mark. And then I add labels and sure enough, my labels jam right on top of this mark, right? And almost right on top of the line. So how do we fix that? Well, I think our natural instinct would be to go into label and we'll just add some spaces to the right. I'm sorry, I just hit the space bar. I'm gonna hit three more, four, my more times just to make it obvious, hit okay, and absolutely nothing happens. No idea why, but as I add spaces to kind of essentially pad this out to the right, they still don't move. Well, we can solve this, as you probably expected, with a blank character. I'm just gonna paste in one blank character, hit okay, and watch those labels move away from the mark. Let's do a couple just so you can kind of see the impact, see how far these move away. So you can have really nice padding 
in your labels by using blank characters. Another little cool use case is with tables. Now, so this is using world indicators data. I've got my headers centered in like, you have to center your headers unless you're a crazy person, right? And but I have numbers in the in the table, and I want all those numbers to be right aligned. So you, you kind of see this. This looks okay, but as we get over here, especially like this column, the centered headers and the right aligned numbers they just don't work very well. So if anybody's a user, uh, an Excel user, you could just indent. You could just format the cell, indent it slightly from the right, and it'll shift all these numbers to the right. Well. There's no such option in Tableau. So again, what everybody would do is add a bunch of spaces to the right. And as you expected, these numbers don't move whatsoever. But if I do add blank characters, I'm gonna add two, watch this thing shift. All of a sudden, these right aligned numbers are in per almost perfect alignment with the headers. It doesn't hold for everything, but this table sure looks a heck of a lot nicer than this one does. So that is a bunch of use cases for transparent stuff. Hopefully Kim was listing uh, links in the, um, in the um, chat. Uh, let's jump back over to PowerPoint. And again, you can check out all the different links with pluralitstwins.com slash cool stuff. And happy at this point to answer any questions if you have them. <laughs> Stop sharing. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Maybe a little intense at times, but <laughs> <laughs> we do and, go fast uh, in it. It's yeah. Really I mean, again, and check out the, the link that Kevin just shared because we've got links to everything. Take your time going through it. And yeah. Yeah. Are, are there any specific questions for these guys? I know for, for those of you that, that might be more on the beginner side of things, you might have felt a little bit overwhelmed, lost, um, but don't be afraid to like ask a question, like, you know, like what the flip is an LOD, right? <laughs> yeah. If this is Pete, I guess I have a quick question. Um, for the table calcs, you showed how you put like the same label on all of the, um, same like marks, I guess, is that, is there a use case that you would do that? Or is that like a, prelim a preliminary step to like a next thing that you would do for like a client or something along those lines? Yeah, I mean, I probably wouldn't label, you know, every mark with the max sum of sales. I, it, for that particular use case, it was essentially just to, sh to show us what's happening as we make these changes. Um, but there's plenty of, plenty of use cases where you're going to need to get the uh, the max of something and utilize it in a calculation, right? So, and that may be, you know, the max sum of sales for the entire data set. Maybe you want to compare every sale against the max one, you know what I mean? As some sort of index or something like that. Um, and you may want to, you know, maybe you want to do it at the category level. So the intention of throwing the label on there was just for us to kind of see, um, see what was happening as we make these little changes. Um, but there's plenty of use cases where you're going to want to calculate that and you utilize it in a, in a, you know, in some sort of other, you know, calculation or uh, as a label or something like that. Yeah. You know? Great. Thanks. Good question, Pete. And I, I'll mention like the, the, the max sum of sales, like sometimes what I like to do is for a bar chart, let's just say I've got five things I like to show as sort of a background. Um, this is probably a terrible thing Big to try example explain. Out there, Kev, yeah. Yeah, I, tr I like to try and I like to give additional context. So what I'll sometimes do on the secondary axis is give me the window max sum of sales. So that the longest bar, right? It's just the bar, but all the other bars have another thin bar behind it that allow you this more easy comparison back to the max. And this, this is just a little tiny bit of context that helps people understand, um, you know, how how the, how those comparisons are working so and i would use i would use a window max table calculation for that thanks somebody's asking for the labels please repeat uh what the uh characters looks like it's direct message to me what the character sequence is to get a blank character let me just uh i'll just share again if people have time and want to stick around um 
Just uh, oh, you really need it. it in the chat, Kevin. Yeah, I, I'll do that. But I, I was, I'll, in I'll case pop, people forget, I'll pop it in the chat. I got he's, it. He's the blank. invisible character in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> If you search for Unicode blank character, 2800 is the one that tends to come up. Now, this you need to find a different one if you're using um, a Mac or something. But for Windows, this one works uh, really, really well. So uh, there's lots of blank characters. I've tried a half dozen of them. And uh, this one actually, I know, works. So 2800, Unicode blank character, 2800. Ken, did you paste that in there? I did, yeah. All right. It's on one of your tips blogs, I think. It definitely I'm going to throw that there too. That's a direct, uh, direct link to that uh, that character. I think you um, might share that in a private message, Kevin. I don't know if you shared it on the. I did share it in a private message. Uh, that's yeah, that'll get you every time. Every time, yeah. There we go. So before we lose too many more people who are going to jump off, and like we're happy to hang out for a little uh, a little while longer and answer some particular questions, um, but. First, want to obviously thank the two of you for taking the time to put this together. It was just lovely. I know that there's a lot, a lot of time and, and effort and energy that goes into creating these things. Um, and I know I personally enjoyed it very much. Um, somebody had asked in the chat, you, you guys had mentioned about, um, you know, how getting help from you guys so we are just as an fyi for everyone we are are um, in the process of launching a tableau lifeline service um where you can just you know say hey you know what i need an hour i need an hour with one of these guys i have a problem that, that i have been spinning my wheels on for weeks or you know days or whatever and i just really need some expert help um, we're going to make that super easy to do, you know, like 24, 48 hour turnaround times, that kind of thing. So um, if you are in desperate, dire need of, of that right now, um, before we have that bo online booking and checkout process squared away, um, just email, either contact me directly, you can contact one of the twins directly, um, or you can email hello at moxianalytics.com. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, because I, I have had a couple of messages about this too is just tablet training in general and um, super super early stages but we are working on putting uh putting together a tableau be beginner focused um tableau training course that would be delivered virtually we are sort of quietly reserving spots for that pilot cohort um that that we'd be offered at a reduced rate so if that's something that anyone on here is interested in um, definitely reach out to me as well and we'll get you we'll get you on the list probably going to be I don't know guys maybe like a June thing would be fair to say yeah probably sure. okay and, <laughs> and, and, and just for context we probably should have said this initially we would consider this this uh session that we did today intermediate to advanced mm -hmm. um so beginner a be, the beginner training will really start at the at the basics of like what is data visualization? What is Tableau? What are these pills and where are the fields and really at, at the very ground level? So um, if, if don't be intimidated, if, if this was like, oh my gosh, this is a lot, uh, the Tableau, the beginner training will really start at the basics and won't get this intense for sure. But if, you're, if there's interest in advanced training as well, <laughs> let us know because we're, 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 we've thought about that as well, but maybe in the future we would offer something if there's interest. Yeah. Um, and I do just also want to say that, you know, these guys have poured their heart and soul into this community for the last, what, like 15 years, 13 years, something like that. <clears throat> and they have spent countless hours answering questions on the forums and responding people to people's messages on, on LinkedIn. And the, 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 these guys' willingness to just help out um, has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I don't, I'll go out on a limb and I'll say that that's probably not gonna be too diminished, um, even though they're coming over to the dark side of consulting. <laughs> um, so uh, so all that to just say, you know, there's still a, a valued member of this community who will continue doing what they, what they do and helping everyone, including myself on their tableau journeys out of the gosh darn goodness of their little hearts uh, but 
they all all you know uh, also will do stuff for money now too so. <laughs> Darth Ke Kevin and Ken. <laughs> um, okay, so with that out of the way, I know we're we're pretty much at time. But if there was any burning questions that somebody anybody wanted to ask um, about the presentations themselves, or um, or things that you're struggling with with Tableau, um, we can take you know five ten minutes and and try to solve that for you. Otherwise, y'all can have a. a a lovely rest of your Thursday. And thank you for everyone for coming. Yes. As you're, as people are dropping off. <clears throat> so. I see a question in the in the um, in the chat here. I'd be curious to learn more about being a good community member. Do they just lurk on the Tableau help page and Stack Overflow, or how do they approach that? I mean, I think you know there are there are a million things you can do there, right? Um, you know, me, you know, I've always, you know, I've always engaged on social media and Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, I do a lot. Of, I've historically answered a lot of questions on the forums. Um, I, I like that kind of one-on-one -on -one stuff. Um, and you know, creating Tableau public workbooks and things like that, as well as writing blogs. Right? Um, Kevin doesn't do as much as the for of the forum stuff, but he also leads a user group and he does a variety of other things. And so it's kind of whatever you whatever you're in, you know like doing. If you like creating videos and create videos, if you like answering questions, do the forums. Um, you know, there are people who have started up these different community projects like Makeover Monday and Back to Viz Basics. And so there are lots of different ways that you can get involved. I think, you know, sort of starting to engage with people on social media is a, a pretty good place to start because you start to learn what people are doing and, and learn new skills and things like that along the way. Um, and then you'll sort of find those opportunities as you go. Yeah. And a link to a blog post. User groups. Presenting at user groups. Yeah, absolutely. If anybody yeah. wants to present at our user groups, <laughs> come to come to me. We'll get you on the agenda. It does not have to be, you know, this to this level. <laughs> By any means. And I did throw a uh, link in the chat. I read a blog post. It's, it's called "Why and How to Connect with Tableau Community," and this is like learning by osmosis. You will, you will increase your uh, your knowledge base and your understanding of the tool exponentially by just being connected with other other human beings doing the same stuff so and present at a table user group that is in there as well yeah so all right well let's um let's let everybody go since it's five after um probably the easiest way for you guys to get a hold of me is linkedin um, Ken, Ken and Kevin are on there as well. Um, feel free to to hit them up, um, and we'll do our best to respond to every mile. There was like chats and chats and chats that didn't get responded to. So um, if I missed your question or didn't address your need, just reach out to me there. We'll get you. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. It's been thank fabulous, you. and thank you all for participating. And we shall see you next month. Thanks, everybody. Bye.